Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Daniel Atkinson. I'm the Education Public Programs Manager here at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. And I am super, super excited about this event. We've been planning this event since December. Um, Christian and Kenneth, when I got this job, I thought, in my mind, I was like, what would be like the ideal fantasy panel? And here it is. It's a total nerd thought, but it was like, whoa. And, then, and, and now it's coming true. So I'm very, very happy about that. Um, unfortunately, Marjorie Perloff cannot, could not make it today. Um, she had to take care of some family matters that were completely out of her hands and out of our hands. But um, I plan on bringing her back eventually for something else because she can handle pretty much anything intellectually, just rock star. Um, just a couple things about our guests who are here today, uh, Christian Book and Kenneth Goldsmith. Um, Christian wrote the book Crystallography and was awarded the 2002 uh, Griffin Prize in Poetry, which is one of the most prestigious prizes there are in, in poetry and uh, coming out of Canada. Um, and Crystallography is one of my favorite books of poetry ever and just astonishing and crushing and lovely and all kinds of other things. Um, Kenneth Goldsmith, most recently he was the Museum of Modern Arts Poet Laureate, which is the first time that ever happened and a kind of incredible thing. He's also appeared on Colbert and a number of other lovely things, um, published the books, uh, including uh, weather and sports and also the nonfiction uh, uh, on creative writing. So um, basically the way that this is gonna work, uh, Christian is gonna present and then Kenneth will present and then there'll be a little Q&A after all of that. So if you could please join me in welcoming Christian Book. Uh, in lieu of Marjorie Perloff uh, uh, delivering what we hoped might be an introduction uh, to conceptual literature for you, I'm actually going to take the next uh, 10 minutes to uh, chat uh, about uh, conceptual literature, and then I'll surrender the stage uh, to my compadre, uh, Kenneth Goldsmith, who will regale you, after which then I will come up and actually do a poetry reading. Um, conceptual literature constitutes uh, one of the recent trends in the avant-garde, uh, supplanting the dominant literary genres of experimentation from the last four decades of poetry. And varied poets, including Kenneth Goldsmith, Robert Fitterman, Vanessa Place, Craig Dworkin, Simon Morris, Nick Thurston, Caroline Bergvall, Derek Beaulieu, and Darren Wurschler, among others, have all contributed to the formation of this global school of poetics, whose research explores the limit cases of writing as a concept, doing so in order to trouble the romantic literary bastions of both creativity and authorship. Conceptual literature has burgeoned into a respected aesthetic movement uh, since its inception in 1996. Uh, Marjorie Perloff has already curated a conference entitled Conceptual Poetry and Its Others in 2008 at the University of Arizona so as to discuss the growing concern about this trend in America, while Northwestern University Press has gone on to ex uh, publish a 600-page anthology of conceptual literature, a tome entitled Against Expression, edited by Craig Dworkin and Kenneth Goldsmith. Within uh, the last uh, couple of years alone, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver and the Power Plant in Toronto have actually staged artistic exhibits dedicated entirely to the poetic legacy of this movement. Now, Kenneth Goldsmith, uh, my friend here, the American exponent of this group, has received much popular fanfare in the media over the last five years for his provocations. And as a result, critics have paid virtually exclusive attention to his work occasionally extolling the achievements of others like uh, Robert Fitterman, Vanessa Place, and Simon Morris. And while critics have written essays about the influence of this movement upon poetry in America over the last decade, most of the studies do not uh, acknowledge the impact of Canadian thinkers like me upon conceptualism, even though two of the three original founders of this group are in fact Canadian literati. Okay, it's technically a Canadian movement. <laughs> uh, they include uh, Darren Wurschler and me. Now, Darren Wurschler, in uh, a book called Free as in Speech and Beer, has noted that current trends in digitized sampling and networked exchange have already begun to challenge the propriety of copyright through plagiaristic appropriation and computerized reduplication. Many poets have begun to question the lyrical mandate of originality so as to explore the potential of uncreative literature written with diminished investment in both authorial expressiveness and authorial intentionality. 
Such poets have begun to use stolen words, forced rules, asemic forms, even cyborg tools in order to mobilize a diverse variety of anti-expressive, anti-discursive strat strategies that trouble the poetic values of lyric style. Jonathan Lethem, for example, has broached such a topic in his own plagiarized essay about plagiarized works under the title, The Ecstasy of Influence, where he argues that literature has been in a plundered, fragmentary state for a long time. Marjorie Perloff in Unoriginal Genius has likewise argued that the concept of genius as an innovative authority able to generate masterpieces without precedent existence has become seemingly untenable in the era of the internet. Uh, nothing, in her words, has quite prepared the world for the claim now being made by conceptual poets that it is possible to write poetry that is entirely unoriginal and nevertheless still qualifies as poetry. Conceptual literature confronts the self-conscious, self-assertive values of lyricism by offering alternatives to this normative condition of writing. Alternatives inspired in part by the procedural artwork of American conceptual artists from the 1960s, artists like Saul Lewitt, Joseph Kossuth, Douglas Huebler, Lawrence Wiener, and on Carrara, among others. And this precedent in the history of art strives to reduce creativity itself to a tautological array of preconceived rules whose logic culminates not in the mandatory creation of a concrete object, but in the potential argument for some abstract schema about art itself. So in this respect, uh, conceptual artists recognize that art after Marcel Duchamp has become so abstracted and so minimalist in its essence that the existence of the objet d'art has dematerialized altogether. Uh, conceptual artworks often exist only in the form of the instructions needed to make the art itself, so that when Yoko Ono, for example, exhibits as a painting uh, her directive for painting the painting, going so far as to ask many visitors to cut out their favorite parts until the whole thing is gone, she displays an oeuvre to be imagined by the mind rather than produced by the hand, a painting to construct in your head. Now we can imagine cognates, of course, for this in the world of literature. Uh, ideas that we conceive for works now become systemic axioms, and the works that we generate from these ideas now become elective proofs. The concept for the artwork now absorbs the quality of the artwork itself. The idea for a work supplants the work, and the idea renders the genesis of the work optional if not needless. The writer no longer cultivates any subjective readerships by writing a text to be read, so much as the writer cultivates a collective thinkership, an audience that no longer has to read the text to appreciate the importance of its innovation. And I might suggest that Kenneth Goldsmith is now among the most famous poets in the world, despite the fact that nobody reads him. The text no longer begs to be read clearly for the quality of its content, but rather begs to be seen blankly for the novelty of its concept. Now, somebody like Jean Bourgeard has, of course, lamented this reversal of aesthetic valuation, decrying it as yet another symptom of the postmodern simulacrum in which the sign displaces the real. Conceptual artwork for him has now become a conspiracy in which both the artists and the markets collude, preserving only the idea of art long after the work of art itself has disappeared into its own abstraction. The idea of art has become rarefied and minimal, leading ultimately to conceptual art where it ends in the non-exhibition of non-works in non-galleries, the apotheosis of art as non-event, and as a corollary, the consumer circulates in all this in order to experience non-enjoyment. Conceptual writers have in turn responded to such a challenge by striving to replace the expressive intentions of the self with a whole array of apparently impossible poetic values, arguing for styles of poetry dismissed by skeptics as uncreative, unoriginal, uninspired, even uneventful. For such poets, the concept for the work now absorbs the quality of the work itself. The idea renders the genesis of the work optional, if not needless. A writer no longer cultivates individual readerships, but thinkerships. Kenneth Goldsmith argues that such poetry now applies principles of conceptualism in artwork from the 1960s to techniques of writing in the 2000s so as to show that for poetry, context is the new content. Goldsmith has even published a book entitled Uncreative Writing, which showcases many of these provocations, earning him appearances not only at the White House addressing Barack Obama, but also on the Colbert Report addressing Stephen Colbert. Uh, such celebrity has incited argumentation throughout the blogosphere as writers come to grips with the official mandated recognition of a literature defined entirely by the automation of creativity itself. Kenneth Goldsmith, for example, encourages his own students to commit acts of temeritous plagiarism, and he describes his own work as a banal brand of both word processing and data management. I am a word processor, he says, noting that the simple act of moving information from one place to another constitutes a significant cultural act. 
For him, writing requires the expertise of a secretary crossed with the attitude of a pirate, with each poet duplicating a text or bootlegging a copy. And for him, artists now acquire cultural prestige from the quality of both their sampling and remixing, rather than from the quality of any original idea or any peerless form. Now, conceptual poets in America and Britain have thus received much attention, primarily for these works that have indulged in acts of recontextualized misappropriation. Uh, Kenneth Goldsmith and Dave, for example, has plagiarized every piece of text in a single Sunday edition of the New York Times, republishing this complete document as a book so as to submit it to the newspaper successfully for review in its Sunday review of books. Uh, Simon Morris, in Getting Inside Jack Kerouac's Head, has likewise typed out the entirety of On the Road by Jack Kerouac, one page per day on a blog, only to republish this output as a pirated edition virtually identical to the classic Penguin edition. Uh, Robert Fitterman, and now we are friends, even goes so far as to use online search tools in order to stalk a random person online named Benjamin Kessler, collecting and reprinting information about him in a book for launch at a gala, to which Benjamin Kessler is then invited as an honored literary guest. Uh, Vanessa Place, in Statement of Facts, upstages even these acts of temerity by reprinting all the court records and all the crime reports written by her as an attorney defending a particularly horrid rapist thereby republishing this material as a work of literature, even though it already is available in the public domain. Now, while works produced by such poets in both America and Britain have enjoyed critical approval from reviewers, uh, works by Canadians have received less consideration, even though many Canadian examples have become somewhat canonical to the movement itself. Uh, for example, uh, works like uh, The Tapeworm Foundry by Darren Werschler, uh, Poets and Killers by Helen Hanoschke, If Language by Greg Betts, Flatland by Derek Beaulieu, and Apostrophe by Bill Kennedy and Darren Werschler, just to name but five works. Uh, the Tapeworm Foundry, uh, for example, lists all the great ideas for p potential aesthetic projects by the author who gives his ideas away for free. Uh, Poets and Killers recounts the biography of a male poet retelling his story by quoting advertisements published in each year of his life. Uh, if language creates anagrams by repeatedly reordering the same fund of letters found in a single paragraph from an essay by Steve McCaffrey. Uh, Flatland maps a uh, successive occurrence of letters in a novel by Edwin A. Abbott, diagramming the dispersal of the alphabet throughout the entire text. And apostrophe collates all the results of a Google search on the phrase, you are. Uh, each work exemplifies one of the four limit cases of writing, what I call limit cases. Works such as these address a quadrivium of extreme formats for expression, uh, and I divide them into four categories. The ready-made writing of the unoriginal text, uh, the mannerist writing of the constrained text, the illegible writing of the unreadable text, and the aleatoric writing of the authorless text. Such poets reframe these acts of writing, be they derived from stolen words or forced rules, asemic forms, and cyborg tools, doing so in order to replace the expressive intentions of the author with a whole array of apparently impossible poetic values, arguing for the viability of work that skeptics might otherwise dismiss as uninspired. American critics, such as Robert Archambault and others, have often dismissed conceptual literature as a weird genre of writing because of its obdurate, if not hermetic, frivolity. Uh, which to them makes such works inscrutable, if not unteachable. Uh, however, uh, the practitioners of conceptual literature, like the two of us, for example, you're about to see, often demonstrate that such literary concepts are actually much easier to uh, apprehend than naysayers might think. Uh, we are undoubtedly going to illustrate the appeal of some of these limit cases by showing that far from being a banal brand of either word processing or data management, such writing can in fact be charismatic in its presentation. Now, Craig Dworkin, uh, a good friend of mine, has written two books of scholarship, uh, Reading the Illegible and No Medium, both of which argue that dismissals of the avant-garde as illegible constitute ideological assessments meant to excuse critics from ever having to contend with the limit cases of writing. You simply have to dismiss it as it's unreadable or it's illegible, and then you're therefore excused from having to address it. He then goes on to demonstrate the ease with which he can perform the closest textual analysis on even the most resistant, difficult works blank books, white noise, empty films, even asemic visual poems without words. He does brilliant readings of them. He shows that such writing does not indulge in novelty for its own sake, as skeptics might aver, and instead such writing illuminates the limits of what is conceivable as writing. Conceptual literature might constitute what Dworkin calls the writing of the new, new formalism, insofar as such liter impo literature imposes arbitrary, uh, but axiomatic dicta upon the writing process, doing so in order to extract an otherwise unthought potential from such a structural constraint. Uh, 
Conceptual literature reveals that in such a culture, writing now finds itself governed not by the whim of a self, but by the rule of a game, a kind of language game, like the ones discussed by Ludwig Wittgenstein, who notes that when playing such a game, we look to the rule for instruction and do something without appealing to anything else for guidance. The poet subordinates all subjectivity to this rule, replacing an act of volative expression with an act of negative capability. The poet constrains the cognitive functions of the self on behalf of other aesthetic functions in the text, be they ready-made, mannerist, illegible, or aleatoric, thus exploring the limits of what writing itself can do. I'd like to introduce you now to Kenneth Goldsmith. I used to be an artist, then I became a poet, then a writer. Now when asked, I simply refer to myself as a word processor. Writing should be as effortless as washing the dishes and as interesting. Hunter S. Thompson retyped Hemingway and Fitzgerald novels, he said, I just want to know what it feels like to write these words. Obama regularly copies his speechwriter's work out in longhand on legal pads in pencil. It helps organize my thoughts. If you're not making art with the intention of having it copied, you're not really making art for the 21st century. From producer to reproducer. Authenticity is another form of artifice. It is possible to be both inauthentic and sincere. The moment you stand up in front of people, you are no longer authentic. The telling of a true story is an unnatural act. Art dealer to Captain Beefheart. You'll never be respected as an artist. You'll always be a musician that paints. If you really want to be a painter, you have to stop doing music. Not long after, Captain Beefheart began referring to himself as Don Van Vlit. A child could do what I do, but wouldn't dare to for fear of being called stupid. The internet is of no relevance at all to writing fiction, which expresses verities found only through observation and introspection, said Jonathan Franzen. Jonathan Franzen famously wrote portions of the corrections wearing a blindfold and earplugs to reduce disruptions. Jonathan Franzen is America's greatest novelist of the 1950s. The new memoir is our browser history. Writers are becoming curators of language, a move similar to the emergence of the curator as artist in the visual arts. Sampling and citation are but boutique forms 
of appropriation. Remixing is often mistaken for appropriation. Our poetry is now beginning to resemble data trails. The internet is the greatest poem ever written, unreadable mostly because of its size. An article in China Daily refers to a young worker who copied a dozen novels, signed his name, and published a collection of his works. Richard Prince recently took America's most valuable literary property, The Catcher in the Rye, and made drop-dead facsimiles, word for word, of the first edition. Everywhere Salinger's name appears, Prince substitutes his. He sells a signed copy bearing the signature of Richard Prince for whatever Salinger's signed first edition is going for that day. Contemporary writing is the evacuation of content. The future of writing is the management of emptiness. The future of writing is pointing. The future of writing is not writing. The future of reading is not reading. The human entity formerly known as the reader. John Cage and Morton Feldman in 1967. Feldman was complaining about being at the beach, annoyed by transistor radios blasting out rock and roll. And Cage responded, you know how I adjusted to the problem of the radio in the, in the environment? Very much as primitive people adjusted to the animals which frightened them and which, as you probably say, were intrusions. They drew pictures of them on their caves. And so I made a piece simply using radios. Now whenever I hear radios, not uh, just 12 at a time, as you must have heard on the beach, but even a single one, I think, well, they're just playing my piece. Andy Warhol said, my style was to spread out anyways rather than move up. To me, the ladder of success was much more sideways than vertical. Hyoji Yamamoto, start copying what you love. Copying, copying, copying. And at the end of the copy, you will find yourself. Cory Doctorow on copying. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Bob Dylan on appropriation. Wussies and pussies complain about it. <laughs> they spoke of the idea that in China, additional books are written and inserted into extant canons. There are 10 Harry Potter books in the Chinese series, as opposed to the seven penned by J.K. Rowling. Individual Creativity is a dogma of contemporary soft capitalism rather than the domain of nonconformist artists. Fiction is everywhere. Toward the end of his life, Alexander Trochi rewrote his early manuscripts in longhand and sold them to collectors as originals. Ted Berrigan stole books by famous authors and forged their autographs. He then sold them back to the dealers he stole them from at greatly increased prices. Today's plagiarism and copyright battles are to the 21st century what the obscenity trials were 
to the 20th. At Tony Alzer's retrospective at the Williams College Museum of Art, upstairs, buried deep within the galleries, the artists had set up a microphone into which anyone could step up and speak. What they said would be broadcast into the entrance atrium of the museum. There were no restrictions on what you could say, only a small note reminding the speaker to be sensitive of others and a gentle suggestion to refrain from swearing. When it was my turn, I said in my clearest and most radio-like voice, may I have your attention? May I have your attention? The museum is now closing. Please make your way to the exit. Thank you for visiting. Although it was hours away from closing, I repeated the announcement again and saw in the video monitor provided people streaming toward the exit. <laughs> again, I made my announcement. At once, a frantic elderly guard came running up to me, grabbing my arm and said, you're not allowed to say that. When I told him there was nothing prohibiting me from saying it, he again told me that I wasn't allowed. Why, I asked. Because it's not true, he replied. You must stop saying that right now. Of course, I repeated my announcement again. <laughs> this poor man was really struggling with what to do with me. He knew that while I wasn't breaking any real laws, by questioning the institution's authority, I was breaking an unwritten social contract. There are no correct readings, only reproductions and possibilities. The problem isn't piracy. The problem is obscurity. Being well known enough to be pirated is a crowning achievement. Most artists want first and foremost to be loved and secondly to make history. Money is a distant third. Information is like a bank. Our job is to rob that bank. The idea of recycling language is politically and ecologically sustainable, one which promotes reuse and reconditioning as opposed to the manufacture and consumption of the new. Information has shifted from, pardon me, interest has, inf Interest has shifted from the object to the information. People insist on self-expression. I really am opposed to it. I don't think people should express themselves in that kind of a way. Shortly before he died, we were invited to dinner at Merce Cunningham's loft on 6th Avenue. Upon entering, we were astonished to see numerous priceless works of art lining the walls. When we inquired, is that a, we were ceremoniously, un, uh, unceremoniously cut off and told that everything here is what you think it is. There were Johnses and Rauschenbergs and even a little Duchamp Zonk check framed in a 70s plexiglass frame close to the floor covered in cooking grease and dust and cat piss. Over many valuable works of art were leaky skylights. During dinner, we asked Merce what would happen if one of those works were damaged. He smiled and said, but of course, our friends would just make us another. If you do something wrong for long enough, people will eventually think of it as right. Art is a license to do things wrong. The rest of the world tries to get it right. We revel in doing it wrong, not knowing, breaking things. I wanted to do a bad book just the way I'd done bad movies and bad art, because when you do something exactly wrong, you always turn up something, said Andy Warhol. Getting it wrong is a privilege that happens only after getting it right. Toward a disengaged poetics, writing books without the need to have any relationship with the subject that we're writing about. Writing is paint by numbers, just filling in the blanks. Quality, not quantity, with larger numbers of things 
judgment decreases and curiosity increases. In China, after I'd finished giving a lengthy, lengthy talk about conceptual poetics, plagiarism, and writing in the digital age, an elderly woman in the audience raised her hand and asked, but Professor Goldsmith, you didn't discuss your relationship to Longfellow. There are no more writings and no more writers because in the 21st century, these have become data and metadata. Choice is authorship, legitimate authorship. Easy is the new difficult. It is difficult to be difficult, but it is even more difficult to be easy. At the Iowa Writers Workshop recently, they were experiencing a crisis. The remoteness of the location traditionally offered the writer two choices, either look into thy heart or look to nature. But once they had the internet, they began looking into the screen. The idea of celebrities adopting art strategies, they're so bored with their creative acts that they're ready to be uncreative. The recent durational performances by Jay-Z, Tilda Swinton, and The National are making boring mainstream. Soon we'll have to find another line of work. Acting is plagiarism. I'd never heard of Shia LaBeouf until he started quoting me extensively on the web, claiming my words as his own, claiming me as his collaborator. Normally, when these kind of scandals break, what we see is a James Fry going out and apologizing. He is shamed and everybody is shamed. LeBeouf plagiarized and instead of apologizing, he decided to tap into the vast bodies of strategies around free culture that have been developed over the last hundred years and use that as a defense instead of a typical apology. Today, we face what I call the LeBeoufian moment. <laughs> the limiting point at which all art based on questioning authorship is now pointless. But what must it become, art post LeBeouf? <laughs> Nam June Pike once said that the internet is for everybody who doesn't live in New York City. Just before, we, just before the reading at the White House, Obama passed through the green room where we were sitting. He stopped, looked at us, pointed a finger, and said smilingly, you guys behave. <laughs> Suddenly, the voice of God boomed. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. As he was about to take the stage, he turned heel, popped his head back into the room, stared at us long and hard, and said, no, you guys are artists, misbehave. I always joke with my students that poetry couldn't be as hard as they think it is, because if it were as hard as they thought it was, poets wouldn't do it. Really, they're the laziest, laziest stupidest people I know. They become poets in part because they were demoted to that job, right? You should never tell your students to write what they know because, of course, they know nothing. They're poets. If they knew something, they'd be in that discipline actually doing it. They'd be in history or physics or math or business or whatever it is that they could excel, said Christian Book. <laughs> Two back-to-back -back readings, the first in Chicago, met at the airport by limousine, which drives me to a glamorous and crowded art venue where no one listens. Chauffeured back to the airport all in one day. Superb pay. The next night, I do a reading at a tiny bar in the East Village. Took the subway there. Ten engaged people in the audience. No pay. Turns out to be the best reading I've ever done. Overwhelmed by the so many requests to blurb books, I began a system of conceptual blurbing. I say to an author, write or steal the blurb of your dreams and sign my name to it. I don't wish to see it until I receive the book. That way I can be surprised by anyone, like anyone else by, by what I've written. 
Love art, hate the art world. The art world is cleaved between the market and the academy. A third way, become your own self-invented institution. When the art world can produce something as compelling as Twitter, we'll start paying attention to it again. The gallery and museum world feels too slow, out of touch with the rest of culture, like an antiques market, highly priced, unique objects at a time when value is in the multiple, the many, the distributed, the democratic. In this way, the art world is quickly making itself irrelevant. Soon, no one will care. Sometimes I feel guys sitting in cubicles understand contemporary culture better than most curators do. To construct a career based on the ephemerality of the, of the meme is, it, is at once thrilling and terrifying. If I raised my kids the way I write my books, I would have been thrown in jail a long time ago. Every word I say is stupid and false. All and all, I am a pseudo, said Marcel Duchamp. Beckett, in 1984, on Duchamp's ready-mades, a writer could not do that. There is nothing that cannot be called writing, no matter how much it might not look like writing. All text is used, soiled, and worn. All language presenting itself as new is recycled. No word is virginal. No word is innocent. Interviewer. In an interview with Michael Palmer, he testifies he prefers writing by hand over typing because the former is a more intimate physical experience. How do you feel about doing everything by computer? Goldsmith. I honestly think Palmer's statement is the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. He must be living in a cave. Writing on an electronic platform is not only writing, but also doubles as archiving. The two processes are inseparable. After giving a reading, another reader on the bill came up to me and exclaimed, but you didn't write a word you spoke tonight. It was true. Somehow during Christmas time in a small house crammed with extended family, reading the Sunday paper is acceptable, but reading a book is considered antisocial and rude. Many times I've been asked while reading, is everything all right? <laughs> Driving down a Los Angeles boulevard, a billboard was legible from half a mile away. It said one or two words. In Los Angeles, people are used to reading single words at very large distances and passing by them very quickly. It's totally the opposite in New York, where we get our information from reading a newspaper over somebody's shoulder in the subway. Pointing at the best information trumps creating the best information. Preloading, constructing a flawless writing machine before the writing starts, alleviates the burden of success or failure, mitigates the ego, annuls the small-mindedness of authorship that invariably comes with a more conventional mode of writing. When you challenge someone not to read, they read closer. When you say a text is unreadable, you guarantee yourself a readership. Many years ago on the way to England to work on a museum project, I was seated in the plane next to a young man who was a classical lute player. We got to talking and I asked him what he was listening to on his disc man. He showed me the CD and began talking about the music. It was a collection of a minor composer's music played from transcriptions of broadsides that were sold on the streets for pennies in the Middle Ages. The composer, however, was clever and included beautifully hand-drawn images on his scores. Over the years, they were framed and preserved not so much because of the music, 
but because of how beautiful they were as objects. While his peers' music, printed and distributed in the same form without decoration, vanished, this composer's scores remain as the only example of the genre. By default, they are now considered classics. We really don't seem to believe that copyright exists, nor do we particularly care. If you make it good and interesting and not ridiculing or offensive, the creators of the original material will like it, said Christian Markley about not clearing any permissions for the clock. W.G. Sebald's advice to creative writing students, I, en I encourage you to steal as much as you can. No one will ever notice. Conceptual writing is a practice that lies somewhere between constructing a Duchampian ready-made and downloading an MP3. Life can only imitate the web and the web itself is only a tissue of signs, a lost, infinitely remote imitation. When asked at the end of his life how it was being an artist, John Dubuffet said, I feel like I've been on vacation for the past 40 years. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Book. Uh, this afternoon I'm going to perform for you uh, some excerpts from uh, my very uh, long-term work in progress entitled The Xenotext. Uh, this uh, uh, is an excerpt from a, what is likely to be the first poem in the book, uh, a poem entitled The Late Heavy Bombardment. Welcome, wraith and reader, to the Hadean aeon of the earth. When myrmidons hurled their cobalt bombs into your molten world of basalt and bronze, when mighty golems swan dove from orbit to drive their glaives of iron into your black mesas, only to be engulfed by the blast waves, when meteors fell earthward in droves, each one a gigaton warhead ablaze. When supervolcanoes erupted flammavomis after each hammer blow from these endless blitzes of aerolites and firebombs. When bolides of brimstone collided then exploded into ablative cascades. When tsunamis of lava rained down like napalm, bedrowning the subcontinents. When millions of Molotov cocktails shattered all at once upon the cobblestones of hell. When Trojans berserk with rage stormed over the brink of your abyss, vowing to claw your face from the skull of the moon. What dire seed must these onslaughts have scattered like shrapnel across your cremated badlands? What prion, what virus, what breed of spore must have emerged like a spear point or a sword blade from these early ovens of Auschwitz? Each cyanide bonfire burning in reverse, spitting forth a fitful embryo cloned from the smoke and the dross. What orchid must have bloomed among the flamethrowers in the furnace? What dragon must have hatched from the burnt teeth buried in these ashes? Must the universe be so pitiless as to immolate all its offspring at birth? Even now the astronauts have marshaled their forces to march resolute across the kill zone of your God-forsaken crematorium. Even now they forge ahead onward through windfall and wildfire, unaware that far away a doomsayer murmurs prayers against them from a fiendish grimoire. 
What great comet has yet to plummet from the heavens like a rocket engine dousing its jets during splashdown in your oceans of nitroglycerin? What thunderclap has yet to herald the advent of this plowshare which can bulldoze a mountain into rubble upon impact? What matchheads, when scraped against your atmosphere, can ignite its oxygen, turning the sky into a blazing typhoon? Only a demigod like 99942 Apophis can offer you this apocalypse by being the juggernaut that smashes through the massive bulwark of your bedrock. Only destroyers like 2101 Tantalus or 4179 Teutatus can erase all earthlings with the ease of suicide bombers at a marketplace. Can an oyster in its shell survive the inferno of free fall from outer space? Can a crocus thrive in soil made from pulverized meteorites? All hail, hail, bop, and every other super bomb yet to detonate. What great dying must the earth foresee in the barren mirror of the moon? What fate what fury, what muse must gaze upon the grim face of grief reflected in your silver shield, a faceplate of bulletproof glass marred by bullet wounds? What cinders of flame disintegrate in your gray seas of nectar, of vapor, of crisis? What shell shock must greet you when you stumble aghast upon the charred remains of a forest at Tunguska? Its evergreens toppled and blasted, all of them flung asunder like matchsticks. What forgotten holocaust at Vredefort must you yearn to recreate whenever you vaporize an atoll? Even now, your battalions of astronauts stride across green plains of Trinitite to storm the walls of Castle Bravo and Castle Romeo. Even now, Neil Armstrong returns like Orpheus to the airlock, his spacesuit reeking of gunpowder and burnt steel. What American sorcerer must aviate his spy plane by the stray light of meteor storms, the flak from the draconids or the scorpions raining down like glitter dust upon the desert during a nocturnal firefight? What scythe blades must the Vikings forge from the wreckage of an asteroid recovered from Cape York? What archangel must the martyrs placate when they kiss the black stone of the Kaaba at Mecca during the Hajj? What sunburst must erupt like Krakatoa over the Arctic Circle when the firepower of your payload exceeds by tenfold all the dynamite exploded during World War II? Even now, the President of the United States sits alone at night, dreading the grim hour when he must open the memo from his aide only to read upon the page the single phrase, Pinnacle Nuke Flash, the news flash that chronicles the omnicide of the world. All right, the works I'm, I'm going to read to you are examples of, a, of the dark pastoralism in this book. Uh, this is a, a series of uh, works, all of which have the same title, uh, Genetic Engineering. One, Arabidopsis thaliana, otherwise known as Thale cress, is the flowering ephemeral plant native to Eurasia. The leaves of the cress are mauve green with serrated edges, forming a rosette at the base of a long stem with tinier leaves attached to the stalk. The blooms consist of small white florets clustered into a carim around the crown of the plant, and each fruit consists of a silique containing twin rows of seedlets. The thale cress is the first of all species of flowers to have its genome sequenced. 
Moreover, the flower is also the first plant to have a line of poetry enciphered as a gene into its DNA, so as to showcase the use of such biotechnology in the labeling of transgenic vegetation. A viable strain of this plant now contains a Latin phrase from Book Two of the Georgics by Virgil. Nec vero terre ferre omnes omnia possunt. Nor can the earth bring forth all fruit alike. Two. This is Virgil the Georgics, Book Two, lines 109 to 119. Nowhere has soil borne fruit from every seed, for willows brood astride the shaded brooks, and birches gleam in bitter glades. The cairns hold fast to spruces, and the swales give root to myrtles, yet sparse slopes of grit love best the ronces, while sullen fields of snow grow lush with larches. Mark the plains by distant Tillman plowed, be these rustics arabesque, or Byzantine, each orchard claims its realm. No rainstorms but in swollen jungles drench the proud boughs of ebony. No windstorms but in forlorn deserts scorch the brute thorns of myrrh. My words are but hanging gardens for balsams and berries soaked in perfumes. Three, genetic engineering. A song for toy piano, typewriter, and speak and spell, performed with orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Productive, functional, and convenient, language orchestrates our environment, augmenting our intelligence, switching our enrichment to better breeds of life. Asylums, mothers, cocoons, and forceps beget creatures butchered by engineers. We, the infernal children, the offspring of your hives, sing to you like idle gods whose playthings are alive. We are tiny bees of gold bred for a life of thraldom, driven by your ciphers to secure your better future where only we can thrive. Oh, what lies you tell us that life itself is dear, yet we must let its seed be sold. Asylums, mothers, cocoons, and forceps beget creatures butchered by engineers. We, the infernal children, the offspring of your pyres, call to you like avid boys whose minefields are afire. We are holy imps of fear, born to a life of roguedom, driven by your splices to endure your barren future where only we are spared. Oh, what lies you tell us, that life itself is fair, yet we must do what we are told. Uh, this uh, next poem uh, is simply called The Nucleobases, and uh, it is written according to a very onerous constraint. Uh, the selection of the words and their arrangement syntactically is entirely determined by the molecular structure of the nucleotides uh, in DNA. So you're actually getting a, a kind of uh, verbal translation of that molecule. The nucleobases. Adenine. Nurturant creatures, honeybees, nursemaid collected chemicals, cocooning nectarous honeydews, heartsome narcotics, cunningly harvested, numbingly hypnoidal. Cytosine, nymph-like, honeybees cultivate orgiastic nunneries, chrysalid necropoli, heedfully husbanded, cloisters hereafter culturing helitries. Guanine, nefarious Honeybees configure neotenous hothouses, hegemonic nurseries, confining castrated cagelings, oblivious nurslings, callously hive-bound, naturally homicidal. Thymine. Neophytic honeybees construct obsessive nectaries, hexagonal complexes, orienting cloistral contessas, handmaids howsoever hummingly condoning helotisms. 
uracil. Nymphical honeybees co-produce oversweet nepenthes, honeypots connoting ossuaries, crucibles heralding cathartic hymnodies. Uh, this uh, next poem uh, is also written according to uh, a formal constraint based upon an actual sequence of DNA. Uh, it's simply entitled, The March of the Nucleotides. A treasury, it amasses, via twists, knit among runic gaps, almost all regalia to ornament a thought, as lacing can mimic gold cast alloy set a glint at auroras, a tapestry. A tapestry it affirms via tropes that atoms a long clad string can encrypt an alphabet, a formula to uplift all adept heirs, long cries set adrift at abysses, a threnody. A threnody it arouses via tempos odic grief, using calm lament and erotica to disquiet a pageant as utmost awe might avow epic glory set alight at Arcadia, a treasury. Uh, this is an, an anagrammatic text uh, written uh, in response to a famous aphorism by William S. Burroughs, who uh, is noted for having said that uh, language is a virus from outer space. And so this poem is a virus from outer space. Language is a virus from outer space. Language is a pursuer of covert aims. Language frames our virus as poetic. Language tapers our vicious frames. Language for a sum is a corrupt sieve. Language for us promises a curative. Uh, the Xenotext uh, is a long-term project uh, which involves me taking a very short poem and then through a process of encipherment I translate it into a sequence of genetic nucleotides and then with the assistance of a laboratory we actually build this gene sequence in the lab and then implant it into the genome of a bacterium replacing part of its genetic code with my poem so that the organism becomes the living embodiment of my text. Now I've written this poem in such a way that uh, when inserted into the organism, uh, the microbe actually reads the gene sequence and in response it interprets it as a set of instructions for building a protein uh, whose sequence of amino acids likewise encipher yet another totally meaningful poem in response. I'm trying to genetically engineer a bacterium so it becomes not only uh, an archive for storing my poem, it becomes a machine for writing a poem in response. Uh, the punchline uh, to this uh, project is that the host organism, uh, which I've selected to be the symbiote for this poem, is an extremophile bacterium uh, named Dinococcus radiodurans. Uh, it's a bacterium uh, capable of surviving in all kinds of hostile environments. You can scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and it does not die. It can repair its own DNA so quickly uh, that the organism does not mutate uh, or evolve. But because it is so uh, well adapted to the lethality of the universe, it doesn't have to change very much. Uh, it can survive in the open vacuum of outer space. It can even uh, survive 1,000 times the dosage of gamma radiation that would instantly obliterate a human being. Uh, this organism is widely regarded as the most unkillable thing on the planet Earth. And because there are no environments on Earth that might drive the evolution of this organism, some scientists have even gone so far as to speculate that its ancestor may have spent at least part of its evolutionary history in an extraterrestrial environment. Uh, it's a kind of surreal organism, uh, and by putting my uh, poem uh, inside it, I might conceivably be writing a book that outlives terrestrial civilization and might persist on the planet Earth until the very day when the sun explodes. I am, in effect, trying to write a book that lasts forever. Uh, the success of the last one requires that I, you know, try to upstage <laughs> some crazy project. That's why it's taking 14 years and all kinds of money, and it's, a, it's very difficult. Now, I have managed to get the project to actually work uh, definitively in E. coli. I managed to get E. coli to, uh, to work properly. 
Uh, I should note uh, that uh, when the organism writes its poem in response, it actually causes the organism to fluoresce red. It glows red in the dark. And the actual poem that it writes talks about itself glowing red in the dark. So I managed to get a, a, a colony of E. coli to uh, work properly. But nobody seems to have cared very much about that having, me having reached that milestone, uh, in part because I've promised that I would place it within this unkillable environment. Uh, you know, I didn't just promise to put the, the chimp in orbit. I said I'd put it on the moon. And uh, if you get the chimp to survive in orbit, nobody seems to notice uh, if it's not on the moon. What I'm going to do for you right now uh, is actually perform for you uh, uh, these two poems, uh, which I have nicknamed uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, um, in part because uh, of the infernal context of this book. The, the whole book has now become something of a, of a demonic grimoire. I'm going to read to you the, the two poems from the Xenotext. Uh, this uh, poem is the poem written by me, uh, nicknamed uh, Orpheus. Any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre, with wily ploys, moan the riff, the riff of any tune allowed, moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now the organism actually reads this poem, and in response it writes uh, this next poem, uh, nicknamed Eurydice. The fairy is rosy of glow, in fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss, any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay, oh stay my liar. We wean him of any milk, any milk is rosy. All right, I'm going to finish up now with um, uh, the first uh, 10 uh, short sections from uh, a long portion of the Xenotext uh, in progress, uh, a poem uh, entitled Colony Collapse Disorder, uh, a poem written uh, in response to uh, one of the oldest, most beautiful uh, poems uh, ever written, uh, Book Four of the Georgics, which is a, a, an account of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. This is just the first uh, few sections from Colony Collapse Disorder. Airborne honeydew sweetens my spirit with a perfume that by divine decree hath enticed me to perform these sonnets for thee, my maestro Gaius Mycenaeus. Study with grimness the plight of puny gods, warlords in a day-long dynasty whose sieges and jihads I must be laud in song. Scant be my labor, but not my reward, if Apollo favors these rhymes. Annex first to the hive, a haven blind to winds that hinder foragers in flight. Then suffer neither yak nor you to trek across these meadows, nor oxen to dash away the dew from phloxes and grasses. Disperse from thy honeyed stalls the gaily tinted geckos, then repel the red plumed bee eaters which echo flocks of swallows, the progeny of Procne, her blouse still bloody from her filicide. Let no throng of songbirds indulge in such butchery, by which a bee tweezed in a beak is fed to savage broods like a dainty morsel. But let some streamlet of meltwater run near mossy pools of greenery. Then let the fronds of betel palms or olive trees drape each entryway to thy catacomb, where from the oligarchs at dawn deploy their convoy of drones on vernal forays. Thistles and brambles by the riverside beckon thy scouts from the heat of battle to rest a while in hidden groves of shade. Upon the shallows, whether swift or still, place a willow bough or a paving stone, a footbridge for the flyers that alight to preen each winglet made of diaphane. For Eurus often bids the sudden breeze to douse such envoys in spritzes of mist or drown such pilots in speckles of rain. Let flower beds of basil, thyme, and clove overgrow these clover fields, the fiefdoms of the hive heavy laden with the musk of violets overwhelming thy wellsprings. 
contrive that the ingress to the sanctum of the bees be narrow, made from woven osiers or cedar braids, for summer heat can soften firm taffies and winter cold can curdle warm jellies, both disastrous for these denizens who must fix a hole in each wall of wax, filling this fissure with their pollen, then sealing the crevice with their saliva, a spittle which binds more fast than any glue, be it coal tar or pine gum from the hills of Phrygia. True to fame, all bees at home in foxholes can nest in the clefts of each hollow karst, if not in the chinks of some fallen birch." thatches of adobe and straw, if daubed like grout about the doorway of a tomb, can delay the loss of heat from the cribs. But when near this bivouac of the bees, be certain to abstain from the charring of yew trees or the roasting of red crabs. Abandon all scrublands ruled by decay, bayous which echo the ring of a rock if struck, or the bray of a buck if killed. When sunbeams in summer hath evicted the vanguard of winter, thereby ousting the gloom to reclaim a heavenly strength Forthwith do these hoverers in wetlands quiver over every bloom by the stream. Orphaned at birth, the children enlisted in thy army, learn the roster of chores fulfilled by the swarm, slaving together to build more hexagons for the barracks. When sprightly these militias fly skyward, marvel at their feral cloud expanding and diffusing like smoke above a blaze. They seek fresh waters and leafy bowers. Hence, surrender unto them thy tributes, bestrewing hither the hints of sweetness, crumbly balsams and opulent hyssops. Then let the zephyrs caress thy sleigh bells, the wind chimes of Sibylle summoning all the bees to slumber in their cradles. Crusades, however, can spur the unrest of dormant legions bestirred in the hive when rivalries arise between twin foes contending for ascendance to the throne. Notice from afar this call to slaughter which must sway the fey mob of rioters, their hearts athrob with pending warfare. Hearken to the brazen scurls that rebuke the latecomers unequipped for battle, each blast of the trumpet inciting them to muster themselves to flex their wings, to knit their thews, rehoning each stinger to rally around the camp of their king and by their shouts defame all infidels. Lowlands in spring become a battlefield for these insurrectionists who surge forth from their fortress, igniting a skirmish whereby they commingle in a berserk cluster, a crazed vortex of multitudes more numerous than all the bits of hail falling like acorns shaken from an oak during a windstorm, or neatly shielded the winged moguls barge into this melee, their pygmy hearts full of godly malice, each vowing to show his twin no mercy until some victor swats aside all blows. A fistful of dust thrown into this fray can quell the frenzy of such insurgents. Subpoena this pair of brawling kingpins from their arena, but condemn to death the Khan more crippled by his injuries, lest he prove too hindersome to the hive. Then enthrone at once the better despot, the one with a golden helmet that shines. For twofold is his kin, the great hero who wags a killing sting, and the elder lord who lugs a swollen belly, all bees alike unto men. Some some crude, some noble, like the sun-cursed pilgrim in the desert, hating his downtroddenness in the dust, or the sun-graced esquire in the garden, loving the delightsomeness of his gold. High-born are the dryads of this feudal father, who in summer lets his maidens filter honey, thin and pure like cognac, mellowing the muscatels of Bacchus. But if such ruckus makes thy dizzy serfs forego their tasks to frolic in the skies, all their forsaken pantries left unfilled, 
then extract the pinions of the patron, so that if unwinged he must malinger, his minions unwilling to move his flag. Let lees of fragrant saffrons lure the bees homeward, and put thy faith in Priapus to safe keep the propolis with his scythe, fending off raids by Martins and looters. Thank you one and all.